Our lecturer this evening is Dr. Linda Caldwell Epps, founder of the 1804 Consultants to Advance Educational and Cultural Organizations. I'll let her tell you a little bit more about that. She could speak to it better than I can, but she brings more than 40 years of experience working with educational and cultural institutions, including the New Jersey Historical Society, which is a statewide museum, library, and educational facility where she served as president and CEO, and the New Jersey Network Television and Radio, where she served as Vice President for Institutional Relations. And she also happens to be wonderfully warm and funny, which I discovered at the fantastic Sankofa Conference on Tuesday at Grounds for Sculpture, which was wonderful. Um, I got a chance to see Linda in action and I learned so much from her and the speakers there. So that was a great experience. And without further ado, we bring you Dr. Linda Epps. Up, oh, Dr. Epps, you're on mute. Hold on one second. Got it. Okay. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Very happy to be with you this evening as we talk a little bit about Juneteenth and and a few other things. So, I am. Um, I've got a lot of information I think to share with you, and I don't want you to be here all night, so I'm going to go through it quickly. But uh, we will have time for questions and answers uh, afterwards. So uh, if you're ready, we can start with the first slide. Okay. My late husband was a big fan of talk radio. And one of the most difficult challenges in our marriage was mediating his desire to have background noise at all times. Uh, that included the necessity to have TV or radio playing as we went to sleep. I'm an all lights out and quiet kind of girl, and he was just the opposite. So the words 10, 10 wins, 22 minutes with the news, entire tri-state cover 24 hours a day, breaking traffic and weather, and all that stuff used to just irritate me. However, I became somewhat of a convert to talk radio uh, with the Michael K. Uh, radio, ESPN radio show when Colin Kaepernick uh, it was during the Colin Kaepernick taking a knee era, and I finally understood the power of and the necessity of talk radio. As a student of American studies, I will admit that I found that entire controversy uh, still now unresolved. If I can have the next slide. Interesting, and um, actually on my own, would turn to the Michael K. show to hear the comments. You can go to the next one. I was simply amazed at the um, lack of understanding by many black and white about Kaepernick's so-called controversial stand or kneel in the cause for justice. Um, just in case some of you need a little review, according to Google, and I quote, in the 49ers third preseason game in 2016, Colin Kaepernick sat during the playing of the US national anthem prior to the game, rather than stand as is customary as a protest against racial injustice, police brutality, and oppression in the country. The following week, and throughout the regular season, Kaepernick kneeled during the anthem. The protests received highly polarized reactions, with some praising him and his stand against racism and others denouncing uh, the protest. The actions resulted in a wider protest movement, which intensified in September 2017, after President Donald Trump said the NFL owners should, quote, fire players who protest during the national anthem, end of quote. Kaepernick then became a free agent after the season and remained unsigned, 
which uh, numerous analysts and observers have attributed to his political reasons. In November 2017, he filed a grievance against the NFL and its owners, accusing them of colluding to keep him out of the league. Kaepernick withdrew the grievance in February 2019 after reaching a confidential settlement with the NFL. His protests received renewed attention, however, in 2020, amid the George Floyd protest against police brutality and racism, but he remains unsigned by any professional football team. Although th I think I heard that he did just have a workout with the Raiders and the, the rumor is that he is being considered. So during my processing of the Kaepernick era, I remembered my dad and wondered what position he would have taken. Fiercely political about civil rights and equality. He also considered himself a proud and patriotic American. And I wonder what position he would have taken on Kaepernick. I can remember overhearing a conversation he had with my younger brother about the United States as a strong military force that had never been defeated. He said this with such pride. I remember him saying, no force, no country, after the Revolutionary War has invaded this great country of ours. So this is the conflict many marginalized people face. Being proud of being a part of the United States of America, in spite of the racism that they may, or sexism that they may have experiences. I had our handyman working for me who had recently just set a come here to the United States from Peru. I asked him why he made the decision to come to the US during the time we were seeing images of immigrant children being separated from their parents and placed in detention centers in cages. He said in his very broken English, I am nothing in Peru and no opportunity would ever come to me where I could be something. No opportunity came to me and no opportunity would come to my son who, if I stayed there, would have been a nothing. Here, my son can be Obama. And he said it just like that. The tension of being the, uh, the other in the United States is to believe in the ideas of this country without having access to the many of those opportunities that make this such a great place. Well, my dad died in 1984, long before the 9-11 invasion. Along with stories that reveal, uh, revealed his patriotism, he would often tell the stories of his disappointment and his anger. Next slide, please. It was really a, a conflict for him um, because again, he loved his country, but he also had an allegiance to his race, which he thought was suffering. And this tension um, between Uncle Sam and those that are marginalized began in 1619 and remains with us today. Next slide. But the story that my father liked to, twel to tell to illustrate his point was the story of Isaac Woodard. Isaac Woodard Jr., born in March 18, 1919 and died September 23, 1992, five years younger than my dad and lived five years longer than my dad, was a decorated African-American World War II veteran. On February 12th, 1946, uh, after being discharged, uh, honorably discharged from the United States Army, he was attacked while still in uniform by Southern Carol uh, South Carolina police as he was taking a bus home to see his family. The attack and his injuries sparked national outrage and galvanized the civil rights movement in the United States. The attack left Woodard completely and permanently blind. Due to South Carolina's reluctance to pursue the case, President Harry S. Truman ordered a federal investigation. The sheriff, Linwood Shull, was indicted and went to trial in federal court in South Carolina, where he was acquitted by an all-white jury. This miscarriage of justice came because the bus stopped at a bus stop that did not had a segregated bathroom. It allowed no blacks to enter their bathroom facilities. And Woodard asked the bus, the bus driver to stop at the next town so he could go. And that's when the argument ensued. Such miscarriages of justice by state governments influenced a move towards civil rights initiatives at the federal level. 
Truman subsequently established a national interracial commission, made a historic speech to the NAACP and the nation in June of 1947, in which he described civil rights as a moral priority, submitted a civil rights bill to Congress in February of 1948, and issued executive orders 9980 and 9981 on June 26, 1948, desegregating the armed forces and the federal government. Next slide, please. My dad would be amazed by the events of today and that a national holiday commemorating Jun Juneteenth would be a reality. His personal shame was that he was declared 4F and could not serve during World War II. He had no vision in his left eye, he was born that way. He would have turned 108 this past May. He did not talk much about himself, but we all know uh, what we all know of that particular shame of his of not serving in the war. We knew because his twin brothers would often tell their story of their being orphaned when their mother died in 1926 and how their father claimed he could not take care of them and the other young children became wards of the state because my grandfather had them removed from the house to what was supposed to be an orphanage, but my father and his twin brothers were really sent to a work camp in Florida. My father ran away after one year, he was 12 years old, and somehow made his way back to New Jersey for 18 months, saved enough money to make the trip down back to Florida to rescue his twin brothers. They were proud of him for doing this. And this is where the stories of his, not, his shame of not being, served, being able to serve in World War II would surface. How would my father have viewed the Kaepernick controversy? How would he have viewed Black Lives Matter? What take would he have on uh, us having Juneteenth as a national holiday? All are a contradiction and we could write volumes about that contradiction. I am still not sure about how uh, he would think we should be celebrating Juneteenth. I'm not gonna offer much clarity today on the contradictions, but I am going to review a little bit about why it is um, and offer perhaps a slightly altered take on how it really is a concept that has something in it for all of us to consider. Next slide, please. Whereas on the 22nd day of September in the year of our Lord, 1862, a proclamation was issued by the president of the United States containing among other things, the following to wit, and I quote, that on this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held slaves, held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall then be thenceforth and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they may take for their actual freedom. Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, except the parishes of St. Bernard, Plaquemines, Jefferson, St. John, St. Charles, St. James Ascension, Assumption, Terrebonne, LaForge, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia, and also the counties of Berkeley, Aramac, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princeton, Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. Did anyone hear New Jersey in that long list of states and territories? If you did not, can you tell me why? The one state you did hear mentioned was Texas, and it is that state, the state of Texas, or any event that happened in the state of Texas that brings us here tonight. And the next slide. In just about every audience I address, there are those present who do not know New Jersey's complicated slave history. I can no way give a detailed discourse but tonight, but let me share a few important things with you about New Jersey's history with slavery. Carteret and Berkeley declared when the colony was started in 1664, anywhere between 40 and 150 acres of free land for every slave imported to work on that land. 
the price given for free depended upon the ability of that enslaved person to work. Bergen County and Perth Amboy had industrial slavery as well as farmlands and were two of the largest places, the, the places in the state that held the, the largest number of slaves. Most of us think that it was the Southern part of the state. New Jersey is that rare state that during the Revolutionary War, the amount of people in, enslaved actually increased as opposed to decreased. In 1884, the gradual emancipation of slavery was called for in New Jersey, but it took until well after the Civil War for slavery to be completely eliminated in this state. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, many do not know of the Lost Souls Project, which is fairly a new project, but that with 1804 came the resale of many of the slaves that were held in New Jersey to Southern markets. For New Jersey, slaveholders realized that they did not have to lose money, but indeed could make a handy profit by selling their enslaved people or the children of their enslaved who were still in slavery to Southern markets. The 13th Amendment passed in 1866 was ratified, finally ratified New Jersey a few years. It was the last Northern state to ratify the amendment, which called for the freedom of every man and woman within the state of New Jersey. There is recent scholarship that suggests that Bergen County did not abide by this law and that the last enslaved people were here as late as 1878. And even after the elimination of slavery in the state, next slide, please. There was a form of Jim Crow that operated well into the 1960s. This is a uh, image of a book on Chicken Bone Beach, which was in Atlantic City, which was a segregated, had a segregated area or a segregated area of the shoreline in Atlantic City where in the only place where black bathers were allowed to, to uh, sit. And the next slide, please. It is this particular form of Jim Crow, of racism, of segregation, that led to many of the troubles that we had from 1964 to 1968 in the state of New Jersey, where we had uh, over 30 urban uprisings. So the next slide. This is Norick and the next slide. Okay, so Juneteenth officially called uh, Juneteenth National Independence Day and also known as Jubilee Day, Emancipation Day, Freedom Day and Black Independence Day is a federal holiday in the United States commemorating the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans. It is also often observed for celebrating African-American culture. Originating in Galveston, Texas, it has been celebrated annually uh, on June 19th in various parts of the United States since 1865. The day was recognized as a federal holiday on June 17th, 2021, when President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law. Juneteenth's commemoration is on the anniversary date of the June of June 19th, 1865, announcement of General Order Number no. Three by UN Army General Gordon Granger that I read to you early. It was proclaiming, in particular, freedom for enslaved people in Texas, which was the last state of the Confederacy with institutional slavery. President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation issued on January 1st, 1963, had freed the enslaved people in Texas and all the other Southern secessionist states of the Confederacy, except for parts of states not in rebellion, which I read before. Enforcement of the proclamation generally relied upon the advance of Union troops. Texas, as the most remote state of the former Confederacy, had seen an expansion of slavery, and had a low presence of Union troops as the American Civil War ended. Thus, enforcement there had been slow and inconsistent prior to Granger's announcement. Although the Emancipation Proclamation declared an end to slavery in the Confederate states, it did not end slavery in states that remained in the Union, New Jersey being one of them. For a short while after the uh, fall of the Confederacy, 
slavery remained legal in two of the Union border states, Delaware and Kentucky. Those enslaved people were freed with the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished chattel slavery nationwide on December 6, 1865. The last enslaved people present in the continental United States were freed when the enslaved people held in the Indian territories that sided with the Confederacy were released, and uh, namely the Choctaw Indians, and that was in 1866. Celebrations date to 1866 at first involving church-centered community gatherings in Texas. They spread across the South and became more commercialized in the 1920s and 30s, often centering on a food festival. Participants in the Great Migration out of the South carried their celebrations to other parts of the country. You can change the slide, please. During the civil rights movement of the 1960s, these celebrations were eclipsed by the nonviolent determination to achieve civil rights, but grew in popularity again in the 1970s with a focus on African-American freedom and African-American arts. Beginning with Texas by proclamation in 1938 and by legislation in 1979, each U.S. state and the District of Columbia have formally recognized the holiday in some way. With its adoption in certain parts of Mexico, the holiday became an international holiday there too. Juneteenth is celebrated by the Muscogas, descendants of black Seminoles who escaped from slavery in 1852 and settled in Mexico. Celebratory traditions often include public readings of the Emancipation Proclamation, singing traditional songs such as Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and more recently, Lift Every Voice and Sing and the reading of works by noted African-American writers such as Ralph Ellison and Maya Angelou. Some Juneteenth celebrations also include rodeos, street fairs, cookouts, family reunions, park parties, historical enactments, and Miss Juneteenth contests. When Juneteenth became a federal holiday on June 17, 1921, it was the first new federal holiday since Martin Luther King Jr. Day was adopted in 1983. Juneteenth from others is a holiday celebrated by a few for many years, but over the past few years, it has been celebrated by many. I will admit, I never heard of Juneteenth until I was introduced to the Ralph Ellison novel, Juneteenth, uh, written just probably about a decade ago. I suspect that many of you here have had a late introduction to the holiday as well. For me, it has significance to all, black or white, rich or poor, male or female. For Juneteenth symbolized freedom, and most of us feel a sense of bondage in some area of our lives. We all are bearing some kind of yoke. Women who feel victimized by male chauvinism yearn to be free. Muslims feel the yoke of religious chauvinism living in what is supposed to be a Christian society. Those of African descent are still fighting against the chains of racial discrimination of slavery and colonialism. So since Juneteenth is a celebration of long awaited freedom, let's enjoy the festivities but let us also take this as an opportunity to examine that which holds us back. Let us think about those isms that keep us awake at night, that hold us back, fill us with doubt about who we are and what we are capable of achieving. For it is this doubt, this lack of self-confidence, this lack of not feeling truly free that leads to the kind of power grabbing, backstabbing, the need to show you have more or are better that leads to the ugly kind of commu uh, communities. I feel there are far too many of today. You can change the slide. True feelings of freedom, physical and emotional, lead to true harmony. We have nothing to fear and therefore nothing to feel we have to grab from someone else. Those in attendance, um, in this discussion uh, may remember, I leave you with these words. Now is the time to counter lies with facts, repeatedly and unflaggingly. 
while also proclaiming the greater truths of our equal, equal humanity, of our decency, of our compassion. Every precious ideal should be reiterated. Every obvious argument made because an ugly idea left unchallenged begins to turn the color of normal. It doesn't have to be like this. And I'm going to uh, offer some words from Langston Hughes that he wrote probably about 50 years ago. He says, let my ending marks be the words of Langston Hughes. Oh, let America uh, be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be. Next slide, please. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, the Indians, the Negroes, me. Who made America? Whose sweat and blood? Whose faith and pain? Whose hand at the foundry? Whose plow in the rain? Must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America can and will be. So that's it for my formal remarks. And I wonder if we can um, maybe show ourselves that and have a, a little discussion, perhaps about some things sure. that I've said, uh, perhaps about Juneteenth or anything else that you might have in mind. So I think I should be showing, but I don't see myself. Hmm. And I don't see anyone, else. On it? anyone who wants to show themselves can, it's fine with me. Okay. Uh, well, let me see if I can do that. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. I'm going to allow people to start their video if they would like, and they can unmute if they like. Something that you said, um, I really like that. We usually think of Juneteenth as like a Black holiday, but it, you said there's something for all of us to consider in it, and that's so true. Yeah. We are all... Um... I think, well, maybe not all. There are some very fortunate people out there who are blessed with the kind of self-confidence that they don't feel that they are bearing a yoke of any kind, but many of us are. And I think that this is a, a wonderful time, a wonderful, um, I know we, we hear about runaway slaves and I often said that those who were enslaved and ran away really ran away long before they took that physical flight because somehow within themselves, they believed in the possibility of freedom. And I think that that's what we all have to do, believe in that possibility of freedom for ourselves and for others, and then take whatever steps that we deem necessary to achieve that freedom. Absolutely. Um, does anybody have any questions? What have we got here in the chat? Uh, what was the Manumissions Act of 1830? What did it do? Was that was the, it was 1804 and that was for yeah. gradual manumission. So if you were, uh, I think it was female, you could be manumated at, you could be, you would be freed at 25. And if you were in New Jersey, each state had their own. And if you were male, uh, you would be free at the age, I'm sorry, female were the age of 25, 23, males were the age of 25 when they could be free. However, if they had children, and those children were born in slavery, they still belong to the master. Now, uh, like most of us today, we want to be near our children. So even though um, the adults might have been freed if they had children, they tend to try and stay and work near where their children were being held in, enslaved. And um, some of the slave owners, knowing that at some particular point in time, they would have to give freedom uh, to those children as well, got the idea of um, selling them to the deep South, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, because at this particular time, cotton was becoming king of the South and there was um, a lack of slave labor down there. So they would receive a very handsome price 
uh, and the, the African slave trade had legally stopped. So the only way to get more slaves was to breed them, um, breed your own, or to buy them from Northern markets where abolitionist fever had hit and uh, there were more and more uh, people uh, available that, that could be purchased. I'm not sure of the person who asked that question, but did I answer you? Yeah, I, I believe so. Okay. Right. I'm not sure where 1830 uh, came from. It might have just been a misunderstanding. Does anybody have any more questions? He said, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, any more questions about Juneteenth? Great job, Linda, says Joe, Mr. Oh. Joe Zemla. <laughs> thank you. Big fan. <laughs> Uh, okay, so my well-educated audience. Yes, it is. Well, not really, Joe. I mean, we can't count them in the, but <laughs> I'm kidding. I think I heard that slavery may have lasted illegally in Bergen County to 1875. Mm -hmm. Who would have been charged with enforcing that law? The the local government. Um, I don't, I think what I or did I mention that there? No, I did mention that there was a form of Jim Crow that operated in the state well until the 1960s. It may even, well, actually just about two or three years ago, there was a lawsuit again in Bergen County because they were discriminating against people uh, in a swimming pool. I'll tell you about that afterward. But it would have been your uh, local municipalities were allowed to enact uh, their own rules when manumission came. So let's say I live in, in Newark and I came to uh, Homedale to visit. I could, Home Dell could have been, could have had a law where I had to report to your municipal authority or your city hall or your town hall, report uh, myself as visiting someone in your town. They would give me a time allotment of how long I could stay there. So maybe it was 48 hours. If after 48, and I would have to report and say I'm leaving. And if after that 48 hours, I was still found to be visiting in Homedale, I could be arrested and thrown in prison. So it was, uh, that was, there were, but each municipality had their own rules and regulations when it came to Jim Crow laws at the end of slavery. And I would imagine that they, it would have been that local town and municipality who was charged with um, overseeing the release of those in bondage in those places. Bergen County had a lot of farmland and um, places like Perth Amboy and Newark and Elizabeth, um, where I was born and raised, had seaports. And there was lots of work for uh, people in seaports. And there were lots of people who were enslaved who worked in the ports. Uh, actually, the, one of the um, most popular underground railroad stations was in Jersey City on the seaport. There was some seamen who had a house right near there and would um, harbor runaway slaves and, and help them to steal away on, on ships that were docked in the water. In addition to that, the industrial centers of the North, North in particular, of the North of part of the state, North in particular, um, and, and Patterson used enslaved labor in their factories. And their factories um, were noted for produce, particularly for, for producing those items that Southerners used. So farms used lots of leather, um, lots of uh, buckles and things like that in farm labor. Um, they uh, needed textiles and they didn't have those kinds of factories in the South. The city of Newark um, grew extraordinarily wealthy, producing not only work items, but luxury items for Southern markets. And during the Civil War, they were known for manufacturing uniforms for Southern armies because the South didn't have manufacturing plants to make their own war equipment and to make their own army equipment. And as a matter of fact, New Jersey was the only Northern state that did not carry President Lincoln in either election. It was a state with very strong sentiments. It operated that way when uh, pre-Civil War, and it still operated that way post-Civil War, because a large part of their, of their financial success 
was due to Southern markets. New Jersey is the Southern, the northernmost um, Southern state and had a great connection. There were equal numbers of students who were killed in the Civil War from the North and the South at Princeton University. Princeton was the favorite Ivy League school for Southerners. It was the closest to their home. So um, I, it, it was, it's easy for me to understand after reading how complicit the state was with the institution of slavery, how slavery could have lasted here a good 10, 15 years after the end of the Civil War and after the passage of the 13th Amendment. Hopefully I answered that question who, for whoever answered it, asked it. Definitely. Um, Joe is asking, um, he said, he's not sure if he missed this, but has a Sanko, I don't think he did. The Sankofa report of New Jersey sites with significant African-American history, has that been released? It has not been released, uh, Joe. Uh, if you remember, for those of you who were there uh, on Tuesday, those we asked uh, for your help in trying to figure out how to classify the sites. For those of you who don't know, I'm part of a, a, a five member team called the Sankofa Collaborative. And we present two to three times a year, all day programs on uh, New Jersey's African-American history and culture. And we just completed a two year study on trying to document every uh, place in the state of New Jersey that had some sort of African-American relatedness. Uh, either culturally or historically. And we've come up with well over 400 places. We don't necessarily feel that our list is complete because we think that there are probably some little gems out there that we don't know about. But we will publish the report. We're trying to figure out the best way to classify those sites to make it user-friendly for libraries and historic houses and museums and for researchers and for students. So you can expect that to, to happen um, hopefully within the next six months, although I'm not promising that. But um, I thought that I knew the state's African-American history pretty well, but there were a good number of those sites that I knew nothing about. You'll be glad to know that your Monmouth County work has been recognized on that list um, for those of you who, and you have actually a, a number of sites that are on that list. So it will be public soon, Joe, and to the rest of you. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, we also are trying to get ready for, um, uh, we'd like to create a heritage uh, tourism tour using those sites uh, all along with an app. So if you're in the car and you wanna know, you know what's around you that you might want to stop and see if there's a marker or a, a historic house or a cemetery or if someone's coming by and said, you know, how, what, what, what's this moral pit hall about? You know, I wonder what their history is. They would be able to use the app and, and know that too. So all Alexis, of that. Seriously, sorry, he's having a day. Muting this person. How's that? Okay. I'm Ooh. fine. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're good now. Okay. It's what yeah. was the question. I'm sorry. So uh, she was asking about Sankofa in general. What is it? You know, tell us about it. Okay. So Sankofa uh, comes from uh, Ghana, the Twi, the Twi language of Ghana, and it means that you have to look back to the past to understand where you are in the present and to plot your course for the future. And uh, the Sankofa is a bird, and it's usually portrayed in art with its head turned around, it's, it's facing forward with its heads turned around looking backwards, sometimes with an egg uh, in, its, in its mouth. Mm -hmm. saying that you have to look at your genesis and understand where you come from and what happened to your ancestors before you can understand who you are in the present and before you can turn your head and look at what your future might be, plot your course for the future. So we thought that that was an appropriate symbol uh, to use. Uh, and if you go back to my very first introductory slide, there's a Sankofa bird with an hourglass. I use that as a symbol for 1804 Consultants, my company. So I'm an American um, studies person by training and um, um, American culture has always been of, of major interest to me. Uh, New Jersey culture in retirement has become even more of an interest to me. Um, but that's what Sankofa means. The five organizations, um, my company, the New Jersey Historical Society, 
the William Trent House in Trenton, the Stylesburg Sauerland Mountains African American Museum and Cemetery, and Grounds for Sculpture formed a collaboration five years ago, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary, to um, be help serve as a resource to other organizations that are also trying to discover their African American relatedness, African American history and culture. So at least twice a year, with the exception of the COVID years, um, sometimes as many as four times a year, we select a topic and we devote a day to the coverage of that topic. So we just held an all day symposium on Tuesday that was dedicated to um, highlighting some organizations that are on that list of 400, uh, looking at ones that have been around for a while and ones that are newly emerging. In October, we plan to have a second all day conference for the year, and that will be on making good trouble. It will be an explanation of peace and protest movements in New Jersey over the past uh, 250, I'm sorry, the, uh, since 1664 and to the present during our New Jersey history. So hopefully some of you will be able to join us. Most of our events, actually all of our events have been at Grounds for Sculpture in Hamilton Township. And um, it's, it's usually a nice day there, but their facility is beautiful. And it, it also in your admission to the symposium or the program also includes admission to Grounds for Sculpture, which, which is a treat in itself. Um, we started off doing this as a one-time event. Um, we've been getting good reviews and um, with a following asking us to, you know, to keep doing them. So as long as we have an audience that wants us to do it, we will keep doing them. Um, during COVID, we did have uh, virtual programs. And if you go to the Sankofa Collaborative website, you can see those, those virtual programs. We actually did one on Juneteenth uh, last year that really centered on the 100th uh, anniversary of the Tulsa massacre and had uh, three scholars, uh, one from Stanford, one from University of Pittsburgh, and one from Harvard, who have been doing some work on economic wealth and reparations um, from the Tulsa massacre forward. Uh, it was gave a history of what happened in Tulsa and how the, that community, that black community was um, able to establish a such wealth, why what happened there happened, and where we have been since then. So that's just an example of one. We also did a, a virtual program on health disparities according to race and income. So these are on the, San, the Sankofa website and you can view them, they're about an hour long. Okay. It's two so of the many that are on there. We also, we come out every week with resources for those of you who teach or who just want to be in the know or who are doing projects in your museums and your libraries. We offer resources, a new set of resources every week that you might find interesting and helpful. Oh, that's good. I'm going to check that out yes, because I have you. to, I'm tasked with the education portion of Marl Pitt Hall. So well, I think we decided to skip this week because we're all draw, really worn out from what we did on Tuesday, mm -hmm. but it usually is uh, out on Tuesday or Wednesday of every week, a brand new set of resources and information that you might find interesting. So subscribe and you will automatically get it every week. Cool. That's good to know. Um, do we have any more questions? And if not, I was just going to ask you, you've been to the Marl Pitt Hall exhibit, obviously. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, for you to give your thoughts to people about how you felt about being in that space and seeing how Bernadette and Joe curated it. And actually, I worked with uh, Bernadette and Joe a little, uh, uh, a few years, years ago um, when it when the idea first came. So I am a little partial. <laughs> I think that they have done an absolutely magnificent job. Um, you can feel, you can feel the history in there. You can feel uh, the spirit of those who, who live there and you can well imagine what life must have been like um, for those who were enslaved as well as for those who were free. And I just really, I have congratulated them many times and I'm going to keep congratulating them and sending people there because I think it's just a wonderful job of, of what could be done. Um, and just the, um, the knowledge that they have and that they've tried to bring to life 
uh, about the place is um, just so interesting and so wonderful to hear. Um, and there's so much that we don't know, but we know a lot more than we did know. And that, that's always gratifying. So thanks to, to Bernadette and to Joe and to all others who had something to do with that exhibit. And I can't wait to see what you do with some of your other properties. Yeah. Oh, I know that there are some ideas good. that are out there. And uh, Bernadette asked you to put the headdress on Hannah. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Mm -hmm. I was and very Alan happy Rickard to come down asking, and do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She was asking about the significance of the, the head wrap. Well, women, uh, enslaved women were actually just about mandated to keep their, their head wrapped uh, for many reasons. The, the texture of their hair was different. Uh, many Europeans found it offensive. Um, and, uh, you know, we use it, we do head wraps these days for sanitary reasons in restaurants, but that wasn't necessarily the, the reason for this. Um, it was because the hair was different. There were no products that were here that allowed uh, the enslaved to keep their hair groomed the way they probably would have done it had they been at home. And it, it um, although in some African cultures, there is a practice of women keeping, religious practice of women uh, keeping their head wrapped as well. So that also could have been another reason for some of them, but not for all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very happy to do that and very uh, taken that Bernadette asked me to do that ceremonial head wrap on, on that particular mannequin. And if there are any of the women who did the sewing, hand sewing of those, the, the clothing that they wore, could do to you uh, as well. You're really to be congratulated. And I'm sure that it's a project that you found much pleasure in. I take pleasure in knowing, just knowing what you did and looking at the clothing. And uh, as Joe and uh, Bernadette, and now you know, I mention it every time I can, that uh, they spent all those Saturday mornings handcrafting that garb. Yeah, so thank they you did such that. an amazing job. They really, really did. They life. really yeah. did. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. It's an hour that went pretty fast to me here. Almost yeah, not bad. Year. Not yeah. bad. Did a good job. And we had 65, 66 people tonight. So well, very good. Great. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.